number one, I would say that you have to be prepared already prior to that event. You cannot this just, okay, I want it, let's go. Well, it's like you know, when you have an exam at school, the best is like to practice prior. You cannot just arrive and say, I don't, I don't know nothing, but hey, let's go. Uh, wait, see. Wait, 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 excuse me, can you say that again, especially for some of those kids who don't want to practice? Say that again, Surya. Yeah, it's definitely, you have to practice and prior to that event. Mm. That is a key, number one. What events you do, whatever job, whatever, you know, even if it's just for school to pass an exam or something, you have to be prepared before. You can't just pretend, say, oh, I think I'm, I, I got it. I'm fine. I'll be fine. I'm like, you know, it's not gambling at all. You have to be prepared because, you know, gamble, say, maybe I'm going to win, maybe I'm going to lose everything. Well, you can't just do that for the, any huge events or competition. And as an athlete, you cannot learn over the years. That's, I guess, the key is preparation. That's mean prior to compete that day, you have to be 120% ready, no matter what. And you know, things happen, you know, falling, tripping, whatever things, but at least you have somewhat, somewhat you prepare. And that is very important. That's mm -hmm. it. I think for an exam, if you know you learn all night long or for nights and nights over like for a month before, maybe your test should be more successful than somebody who just arrived and freaking out and start to shake and feel, oh my God, I don't know what I'm going to write down. I don't know nothing. Hi, I'm Devon Harris. Welcome to Keep On Pushing TV, where we share ideas. We share insights that are going to challenge and inspire you to keep on pushing and live your best life. By the way, if you haven't done so yet, may I ask you to subscribe to the channel and also leave a like give us a thumbs up because it helps to grow the channel. We'd really appreciate your help with this. If you're a fan of the Olympics, then there are certain events or certain athletes who become etched in your memory. My guest today is one such athlete for me. She's a prolific figure skater, a nine-time French national champion, the 1991 world junior champion, a five-time European champion, three-time Olympian, and is a three-time world silver medalist. She's a creator of the Bonnelly, landing a backflip on one leg. Yes, you guessed right. I am talking about Surya Bonnelly. Enjoy. <laughs> This is Keep On Pushing TV with Devon Harris. To welcome Surya Bonnelly to Keep On Pushing. Surya, bonjour, bienvenue à Keep On Pushing. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, yes it's, it's, great to, it's great to have you. So, you know, I have wanted to, I don't think I've ever said this publicly before, wanted to visit France since 1977 went to high school and I was studying French. And I never got a chance to go until 1991, just before the Olympics when we were doing international training. And then of course, for the Olympic games. Um, and uh, I, in 1991, I became aware of your story and was really drawn into it, was impressed. There was, you, like our team, you were a trailblazer as well. And so having an opportunity to meet you at the opening ceremonies in France is definitely one of the memories I have from those Olympic Games. What are your memories? What are your best memories from 1992? Oh, well, first, you know, having Olympics Games in your own country, you know, it's a blessing. And uh, it's a great opportunity for our country and as an athlete. You know, it's a big thing because you know that you're performing and you're competing in front of your own people and your own country and your teammates and your family, everyone. And it's really for you, especially for the Olympics. It is a big special event that the whole world is just watching for two weeks. Everyone is glued to the TV and watching. <laughs> it's just, you know, fantastic. Yeah, yeah, I, I, and I agree with you. Those are exact, my exact sentiments as well. I can't remember, were you um, voted to carry the flag or be a, a captain or something? Remind me. No, I did. This. I had to, uh, I was voted to be the sermon, to do the sermons, you know, 
how you how, uh, to uh, how you call this the oath. Oh, to read the oath. Read the oath. Yes. Yes, the athlete oath. oath. Yes. Yeah, all the athletes. Yes. Yes. That's big things and definitely it was tremendous. Uh, in a way, stressful, and in a way, it was a good thing because you know when you belong to a big team like our country, we had about two hundred, you know, athletes and. Uh, and they choose me to do that so he was a big yeah. and i was very proud and uh, yeah it was a great thing very memorable yeah it's it's it, i agree it's huge not only are you representing by the way 200 athletes from france you're representing every athlete from every country in the world at the olympic games you're our representative reading the oath so that was pretty awesome so uh one of the things I'd like to go back a little bit, um, because I remember uh, when I watched that uh, piece about you and first became aware of your story, one of the, um, I want to say, bone of contention uh, was about your beginnings, your birth. I know that you were adopted. And in the um, piece, they were talking about the fact that you were from the island of Réunion, of Madagascar. So and nobody knows for sure. So since I have you here, come on, fill us in. Tell us the truth. Let's settle the story once and for all. Oh, well, yeah, well, you know, I was born actually in South of France, Nice. But mm -hmm. uh, I came from Réunion Island. My biologic parents uh, you know, was from there. And uh, when I was adopted, my parents got me in Nice. And, uh, and they bring me, you know, all what they could, you know, to bring me good, give me good life. And uh, yeah, I started to do a lot of sports. And I was mm -hmm. involved in a lot of sports because of my mom, who was a, a coach, a sport coach. And uh, yeah, and I stopped little. And after, because you're good, you try to do a little more and more and more. And after it becomes your life and it, you can't stop. Yes. It's part of your lifestyle of just training every day. So yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm curious to hear a little bit more about your mom uh, and I, I guess her philosophy or how she believed in living life because I, I read that your name was uh, originally Claudine and she named it Surya, which is the San Sanskrit for the sun because you shine like the sun, don't you? <laughs> well, you know, my mom and dad, when they were young, before to adopt me, they travel a lot, you know, by car. They didn't have much money, but they like to use their vacation. And go and go to different places like India and to go to Afghanistan and Turkey and different places. We go throughout the summer and they would, they would save all year round to go to have those vacations. Because you know, when you're a teacher or coach, usually in Europe, you work for the government, you have those two months break, mm -hmm. you know, like the kids. So, you know, once June they arrive, you jump in a car and come back, you know, and August to be ready for you know the school start in September, so right. they travel and get to to discover a lot of countries, a lot of cultures, and uh, yeah, it was a big thing for them. And after they see a lot of poverty, a lot of kids, you know, wanting needed parents, kids who were on the streets, and all some parents who were like, please, please take my kids, you know, for a little bit of money, and you can take care, and we'll have better life and. They thought it would be a great idea to maybe to, uh, to just process and for adoption and figure it out how to adopt kids maybe directly in Afghanistan or Pakistan or even in India. So that mm -hmm. was a win to really have all the paperwork that they need so they could adopt whenever their next trip. Mm -hmm. And so somehow when they become like good um, parents, adoptable parents, the, the government say, hey, if you want, we have a kid here ready to, to be adopted. And it's right here in Nice, right here in your hometown. If you want, you can just uh, check it out and see if you want it. So at this point, supposedly they, they say yes, because I guess it was less of headache, less trouble, less, you know, because mm -hmm. going back to India, it takes a lot of time and lots of time to organize all that trip. So, yeah. Yeah. How how many um how many siblings do you have? No, well, I'm just by myself. You know, I guess I was a handful supposedly. I was, <laughs> you know, they wanted more kids, but the life made that it didn't happen. Right. Because when they had me, and they had they both kept working, so they didn't have time to to have another kids. And you know, once you start to do sports, 
as you know, yeah. your life is done because it's like school, work for your parents, homeschool, and whatever, and boom, you end up doing couple hours of training a day, and after you say, oh, we should have had more sessions three times a week, and you end up like it's almost every day, and even the seven days a week. So I guess, you know, we didn't have much time, and my parents didn't have much money anyway, so you couldn't have mm-hmm. both jobs. So talking about sports, your, your mom was a coach and you were involved in a bunch of different sports. You're a busy child, weren't you? Tell us about some of the sports you did. Well, you know, because of my mom, you know, she was a sports uh, coach or sports teacher for the government. So once you a teacher, uh, like a PE coach, we could say in America, uh, you were supposed to teach any any uh, activities, any discipline. So, you know, mm-hmm. when it's a- Hill and after the swimming, so whatever, every two weeks or every month, she different activities. So she was good at many, and her background was like, you know, she came from uh, track and field, so she was really good at it. And uh, I touch up kind of a little bit everything, you know, I did gymnastics because, you know, because of my size. When I arrived at the gym club, I was maybe three years old, and they say, yes, perfect size, welcome. <laughs> Yeah. that's super cool and i i wanted to do um tennis and sadly they told me yeah come back next year maybe you'll be taller and so <laughs> right come back because of a skin gymnastics they're like happy to have me and I never touch tennis again right yeah, a lot of diving too and diving was you know part of my life for about five six years i did it diving mm-hmm. and i loved Sadly, I stopped because the water was just too cold. I couldn't stand jumping in the water, come up, go back again, go back on a, you know, on a... Right, right, right. So, you know, it's a routine that I couldn't, was not suiting me at all. So, yeah. I did really frozen pounds while the water was frozen and stayed. <laughs> yeah. I also knew that you did some uh, fencing and competed. Yeah. Right, yeah, yeah, I did fencing. Actually, it was my first competition where I, uh, you know, I won. So it was my, you know, I love sports and I was good at fencing and I was scaring, I was, all the guys were scared of me because I was like a good fighter. <laughs> <laughs> you, were, you were a little Zorro, weren't you? <laughs> oh man. Um, so, but, but you kind of, was gymnastics kind of like your first love in sports? Is that the one you excelled at the most? skating and gymnastics all together you know mm-hmm. once I, when i was three years old and they say yes you can start you know i kind of never stopped until i was uh, 17 or 18 years old and it was my mm-hmm. life and and i i had a choice to go on a national team in gymnastics but uh, i actually choose to go on a tumbling and trampoline national team because i know i could do a lot of competitions and uh, and i excel in it so i thought it would be better to do tumbling because um, Somehow I was really good at it, and we can. We only had to work on one, you know, one, one agrees. Because in gymnastics, right. you have balls, the beans, the bar, it's just a lot of things, and you have to practice right. like minimum five hours a day if you want to be good at it. So, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so what was it about figure skating then that got you to choose that over tumbling? Uh, skating, I think it's. I really made a choice around 70 years old where I knew that no matter what in skating, there is always a possible future. You know, there is always an exit, a good way to get out of this. Somehow proportionally, somehow you can do some shows around the world, like, you know, in France, uh, holiday on ice was a big thing. So, you know, holiday on ice is funny, you know, travel around the world and perform many countries and five different continents. So that was my thing because when I was a kid, would see every year they would come in Nice, one of the biggest arenas that we had and I could see them. And I think I was mesmerized ever since. It was nice to see those big sk- uh, skaters with those nice dresses and diamonds and all that. And I thought it was, you know, so nice. And right. back then we didn't, we didn't have in gymnastics like we have um, Cirque du Soleil. Now, now is a new generation. We have amazing shows. So, you know, 90% of the old gymnasts or champions from gymnastics 
who have a great back background could go yeah. to uh, Le Soleil and perform in, you know, but back 30 years ago, we didn't have this really uh, chance or opportunity. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that champion, you get a medal, thank you, you're happy, and you go back home and two weeks, two, two months later, nobody remember you. <laughs> I'm like, you know, I want to do something with skating because I can, you know, tour. I can travel all around the world if I want. Even right. If I'm not a big champion, I can still do that. So that really mm. was my goal. I love crowd. I love to perform in front of public. So I thought it would be a good idea for me to do that. All right, cool. So um, what, what's your earliest recollection of the Olympics? When did you become aware of the Olympics? And when did you think, hey, you know what? This is something I could probably do. Um, well, Olympics, you know, compared to, to America, I think when you're an athlete, you keep practicing every day. And after if it's good, well, you keep adding more session time. And after if you're good, why don't you go compete and go to, you know, regionals and sectionals and nationals? That is, that is it. But right. some, I become good at it. So I continue. And it was like a, a circle vicious. You know, you keep going, people can continue, continue. And one day they say, hey, you're already a national team and you're a national champion. You can make... You, know, you can do that. Mm -hmm. Right, that's right. What, when, what, what, what were the first Olympic Games that you watched on TV before you competed? Can you remember? Oh, yeah, for sure. My first Olympic Games that I watched and actually it was a family, uh, a big thing for our family because it was 18, 1984 and I was still tiny, but, you know, my parents didn't have much money and we live in a place really kind of outside of the uh, outskirts of the city and we didn't have any uh, water we didn't have any electricity so we had to have a you know everything was running with either solars or generator or you have to run to the spring to get some water and things like mm -hmm. that so it was a choice that my parents really wanted they want to live very green very uh, mm -hmm. efficient but we didn't have electricity. But when it happened that the Olympic Games came close, my parents say, okay, we need to get the generator working because we want to buy a TV. Because I didn't have TV. And right. I had TV until I was 10 years old. But somehow the Olympics, said, we're going to buy this TV. It's going to be the first ever color TV. You know, for now, the new <laughs> generator, I don't know what does that mean, but for us, like Right, know, yeah. Um, so it was a big thing, big commitments and investments. We bought that first TV ever just to watch 1984 Olympic Games in Sarajevo. So that was a big thing. And I was glued for two weeks watching it. So, yeah, yeah. it was amazing. Did you have a, um, an, an idol in figure skating, somebody you aspire to be like? Uh, back then, no. I was just happy to watch everyone. I mean, for sure, I was rooting for the national champion because she was... From Paris and we were like oh my god we have a French person going to the Olympics it was like amazing but I remember very tiny watching you know like uh, uh, Scott Hamilton and I was like mm -hmm. wow this guy he's amazing so this may be smaller than everyone else in the, you know but he's the best and actually he won the Olympics so he mm -hmm. and it's Katarina you know she was a big name she was so famous so she was like the Madonna of the skating, you know, mm -hmm. everyone was like bowing and do everything for her. Katarina Witt is about to perform and skate. Everybody stopped breathing, eating, drinking. It was too much. <laughs> so it right. was a, this era was like, like no one, no one, because it was very special. And so I watched yeah. it. To use the next day, I want to practice more. And I was so excited to do what. I just saw on TV and it just happened and 88 same things. So, yeah. Yeah. So I remember um, Katarina Witt was one of the big uh, names, one of the big stories with uh, Debbie Thomas, who was a, 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 an American girl, a black girl who was, I, I want maybe the first black girl to ever um, contend for an Olympic medal in figure skating. And so here you are, four years later as another black athlete um, contending uh, for an Olympic medal. Um, 
how did you find your journey in figure skating as a black athlete? Because let, let's face it, the Winter Olympics is white, right? In ice and snow and, and athletes, I mean, uh, you know, same in my sport of bobsledding. Um, did you, how did you find that journey? Did, did you feel like you, did you feel different? Did you feel like people saw you differently? Well, uh, definitely. Debbie Thomas was uh, you know, a pioneer because she yeah. was a black, uh, skater to perform in so high levels. So, you know, I think she opened the doors and probably opened the uh, people's mind, you know, in, especially for sports. And uh, I think it was a good thing. And being an American, I think it was even more welcoming. And I think, I think people just thought it was just great to have an American or uh, North American uh, competes. I think that was great. And being on a top three was even better. Mm -hmm. And so me coming after four years later, uh, definitely felt that it was like, okay, well, we had one. Now here we go. The new gener generation is about to step in and show that it's possible. And I think it's, I, mean, I think it's good. I mean, it's, it's great that really somebody breaks a barrier and open the door for the next, the few next generation after. Mm -hmm. So, you know, f the world, people in general, world organizations, cultures tend to resist change um, or they, they, they accept change very, very, very slowly. And certainly during the time that you competed, Surya, you, um, they, the thinking that the culture in figure skating was that it was more finesse and grace. And you are a very athletic skater. Um, what challenges? Talk to us about the challenges that you had just kind of breaking through. I mean, today they are accepting more athletic skaters, but back then it seems that your style wasn't so accepted. Well, I think back in the days when we talk about you just say, you just mentioned figure skating, especially for female. Back in the days, it was like thinking that it was like those pretty lady skate on those frozen palms or legs, mm -hmm. and uh, with those pretty long dress and very you know classy and very fancy, and that was the image of figure skating. And it took long time to you know to move on to the new generation and say okay, figure skating is also a sport. And Katarina Witz was kind of like break this image and say, hey, I can be a cute and a very uh, sexy lady and very mature lady and still skate and be an, an athlete. So that was her image because she was really, you know, for many men, I'm sure. So many mm -hmm. men watched figure skating because she was, you know, back then, hot, really a, a woman, you know, the perfect mm -hmm. that you imagine for a woman. As an athlete, you know, she was pretty good, good performer. And um, and yeah, and after when he hopped to another four years, we can say, it was skating image was more like more athletes, you know, everybody was jumping, all triple jumps. And, uh, and it was more tough and it, everyone was, you know, competing to beat that record and say, hey, I can compete and be champion and do all the triple jumps. And back in the days with Katarina, you know, she was happy to just do two and it was fine. Just be mm -hmm. graceful and fine and on ice and with two triple jumps could get you a nice Olympic title. Well, four years later, the whole thing got transformed and we start to fight for those triples and me because I felt that if that girl from Japan or from America can do two triple, maybe I can do four triple in my program because I want it and I will do everything to make it happen. Mm -hmm. And we start now is a new, you know, a new generation arrive on ice. And me from being an athlete and and being a gymnast, it was all about performing, work harder, practice wisely and try to figure it out how to, you know, if you want title, uh, uh, you need to do more, more jumps and more, uh, have more skating skills. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about, uh, you're talking about work harder. First of all, did you find that your gymnastic background uh, helped you with some of the the jumps and so on that you needed to do in figure skating? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think for me, I don't know for 
it worked for everyone else, but for me personally, you know, I was advantage. I had a big advantage because of my skating, my gymnastic backgrounds, mm-hmm. and together for me it was a big, big uh, important things, and mm-hmm. uh, and it helped me because somehow the tumbling, you know, gymnastic or tumbling, make you walk with your whole body, not just. Uh, you know, on ice, you know, you stay, you skate, and whatever you do, your rotation, couple pretty spin, but that's it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it requests a lot of courage and lots of strength because gymnastic is super hard, and you have to go upside down and twist it and do a lot of things that is like un- unimaginable. Right. And I think when you arrive on the ice, you're like, wow, actually, it's almost easy. It's not, but it, it felt a little bit yeah. easy. It doesn't request so much, you know, hard uh, training. I believe. Talk, talk to me about the. Um, when you talk about working hard, you mentioned the word courage. Talk to me about the, the the mindset that you need. First of all, I guess I want to know is. Talk to me about the training that you do in the summer uh, for for figure skating. What what is that like? Oh, well, skating is already hard all year round, but in the summer, because you know there is no school, everybody on vacation, supposedly. Well, I guess you, us as a skater, we just spend time on the ice all day long, pretty much. You know, we just practice seven to eight hours a day. And on the top of that, you do some workout off ice and, you know, so it's all, and some ballet and take some classes. And it's all about high regimens that you need, so it will benefit you for the rest of the seasons. So you're saying to me that in the summer, you guys are still skating on an ice rink? Yes, yes, oh. yes. Hmm. Yeah, because, ne- ne- you know, never imagined that. Yeah, oh yeah, skating is like, especially back in the days, I think uh, we didn't have much uh, time, you know, sometime in Paris, I've, it's a still do, I think, in these days, but I think in June, all the rink closing in Paris. So you need to find a place. You, sometimes June is a month where you can have vacation, relax, because, uh, you know, July and August, you're going to d- get it so hard and you're going to cry because you practice so hard, but it is mm-hmm. this way to practice and be ready for September for the new season. So in the summertime, you will move to another place, either in, uh, by the oceans, or in the mountains, usually it's preferable to be in the mountains because it's altitude, so it will help you. You know, mm-hmm. it's really as an athlete to practice in altitude, super high. So it will go and it's like over 10,000 feet. Usually it's normal to practice. It's probably, it's very hard the first week, but after that, you can practice for two months. Once you arrive in regular level elevation, and you, for competition, you just fly, you know, your program, you're just like, I'm fine, I can do another one. <laughs> um, yeah. Compared to other who just practice in regular altitude, flat, oh mm-hmm. my God, like, you know, you just, like, you know. Yeah, so, like, absolutely. So talk to me about um, mindset, mental toughness, because, you know, you uh, figure skaters, it's one person on the ice. Um, I'm not sure how many people are in the stands, and you know that the cameras are, are on you, and you are at the center of attention for the entire world during the length of your program. What what kind of mental fortitude does it take to get out there and be your best? Well, first, you don't have much choice. When they call your name, you're like, oh, here we go. It's my mm. turn. Right. Uh, it is. You know, the Olympic Games can be definitely freaky and scary and all you can imagine because there's a lot of people and the tension is like uh, triple or quadruple, you know, compared to a regular competition, compared to nationals or, you know, Europeans. Because here, you know, that it's just like not only the skating specialist, but it's just like the whole world you want to and your country. and probably your president who say, yes, maybe she's a medal contender. So let's put a wish and a mm-hmm. power on her and, you know, and it is stressful. And as an athlete, you don't want to uh, disappoint anyone. You know, first it's yourself, number one. And after it's the rest, your family, your country, your any, anyone, and it is hard and your team because, mm-hmm. you know, 
Olympics, at the Olympics, we feel that team, that team, that uh, leadership, that group that's bonded together for two weeks to make it happen and bring back as much medal as possible for your country. So it is extremely stressful. But in a way, you're like, wow, I have so huge chance compared to so many athletes who just practice, practice, and maybe will have never even have a chance to go to the Olympics. So I have this chance. I have to take this opportunity and bring it and make it a positive journey. And, mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, and you practice so hard. You like practice for sometimes four years or even less for years to come to that point. And when you arrive there, it's, uh, it is what it is. And sometimes you're lucky, sometimes you're not so lucky, but at least you try your best and that is the most important. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's what yeah. I did. Compare. So what advice would you have, Surya, for someone who um, is on the verge of a big break, you know, I, I don't know, a, a, a dream job, uh, a big sale, and they're feeling the pressure of the moment, how, how would you advise them to kind of center themselves and be prepared to just go kill it? I think, number one, I would say that you have to be prepared already prior to that event. You cannot this just, is true. okay, I want it. Let's go. Well, it's like, you know, when you have an exam at school, the best is like to practice prior. You cannot just arrive and say, I don't know nothing, but hey, let's go. Uh, wait, 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 excuse me. Can you say that again, especially for some of those kids who don't want to practice? Say that again, Surya. Yeah, it's definitely. You have to practice and prior to that event. Mm -hmm. That is a key, number one. What events you do whatever job whatever you know even if it's just for school to pass an exam or something you have to be prepared before you can't just pretend say oh i think i'm i, I got it i'm fine i'll be fine i'm like you know it's not gambling at all you have to be prepared because you know gamble say maybe i'm gonna win maybe i'm gonna lose everything well you can't just do that for the, any huge events or competition and as an athlete, you kind of learn over the years that I guess the key is preparation. That means prior to compete that day, you have to be 120% ready no matter what. And you know, things happen, you know, falling, tripping, whatever things, but at least you have somewhat, somewhat you prepare. And that is very important. That mm -hmm. you, I think for an exam, if you know you learn all night long or for nights and nights over like for a month before, maybe your test should be more successful than somebody who just arrived and freaking out and start to shake and feel, oh my God, I don't know what I'm going to write down. I don't know nothing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Indeed, indeed. So, um, you know, every journey has its challenges. And, you know, you're talking about all the work that you have done and sometimes you trip or you fall and, you know, you hear the crowd. What is that like, by the way? Your, your center eyes and you're going through your routine. Next thing you know, your butt is on the ice and the crowd go, huh. Oh. Do you hear that? Um, do you feel the energy? What are you thinking? Usually, you know, you're so focused when you perform that you just, besides the music, you don't hear anything else. But it's true. I mean, uh, if there is something negative, you try to move on very fast and pretend that it didn't happen and try mm. to move on and kind of forget what, what this horrible thing happened. And it's OK, I still have that much elements to go. So I need to mm -hmm. move it more and refigure it out what's going to what happen and forget about that because you don't want to think about it. And uh, yeah, and move on and try to be positive and reset your technique and, um, and maybe have a chance to try again. That's element if it's mm -hmm. time. Right. And, uh, Definitely, the crowd can be a, a big help, but when they kind of, ooh, you're like, oh, wow, I kind of bum it. <laughs> yeah, so, you feel yeah, like, yeah. You don't want to be the, feel like the loser of that arena, but you feel bad. But in a way, we make so much effort. And in a way, you feel like, hey, how many people who stand there and sitting here who can do what I can? I guess almost no one. So I guess, you know, it's, it's a risk, but it's right. a bit of Take that risk because at least you try it because some people don't try and what well, they don't do but they don't try at least we have a chance it's gambling but it's it's worth it to try 
Yeah, yeah, I, I, I so agree with that. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, I've, and we all know the stories of your, your different competitions. And I, I'm sorry, I have to go to 1994. And um, you, you were awarded, I'm not going to say you won, you were awarded second place after you had skated your heart out. Um, and, you know, you took the medal up from around your neck. Um, what, what, what can you remember about how you were feeling in that moment? Uh, well, you know, things go so fast and you feel like, wow, this program was amazing. Or I did, I did my best. And, uh, you know, I could, as an athlete, you never say it was perfect because it's never perfect. You know, when you try, you try so hard to do and. And to excel, you already try to do more and more and more, and it's really hard to, you know, get all the way to the perfection. And as an athlete, also you think there's always something you can do better. Maybe somebody can tell you that was perfect, but as us, you kind of uh, critical, and you try the best you can, so it's never good enough often. Mm -hmm. And so when I compete, I think I did pretty good. So I. I thought that maybe it could be my year because I guess in skating it's also it went by years sometimes. Right. But you're you're not ready yet. In two years it will be your turn. So you just have yeah. to be this kind of thing. So I thought for many years it was not my year, and uh, that was this season could have been my season to be able to to win the title. But yeah, it uh, it was some big emotions. The most important I know that I did my best. After, after, yeah, after it depends of the judges, depends of the crowd, depends of the skater I compete against. And uh, yeah, there's many, many things, way to think. But I know as an athlete, I know that I don't have any regrets. Even mm -hmm. almost later, I still, I'm okay with what I did, so I'm okay. Yeah, I guess it comes down to that, right? Once you have done your best, you have strove for excellence. Um, Unfortunately, you compete in a sport where you're relying on somebody else to tell you how well you did as opposed to the clock exactly. or a tape measure, uh -huh. right? Yeah. Those, those things are unbiased. Mm -hmm. That are really difficult, and I wish my sport was different, but somehow it's like that. Sadly, it's not like, you know, when you have a timer, you say, okay, well, whatever, like for Michael Felt, it all depends on how many seconds you do. If you beat that, mm -hmm. records or whatever, it is what it is whatever which country you belong it's all about mm -hmm. timing and uh, something for for track and field well gymnastic is a little bit like skating but gymnastic they have better quotation and it's easier to judge you know when you see a triple with a twist whatever like simon simon bell when she perform and she do a flow exercise and she has this amazing uh uh, skill that no one does obviously you have to give a 10 and that's it yeah yeah talking about skills that no one does what is a banali tell me <laughs> tell oh. those of us who don't know what a banali is oh well i guess it's a it, that's a special backflip that i did and i created that now have my names and that was so nice that People recognize it, and obviously, I mean, it was no choice. I was the only one to do it, and I created it like almost thirty years ago. So right. So you're the you're the first to do a backflip and landing on one leg in competition, and the only person to do it. Yes, also, but before that, before to go in competition, I was doing a lot just for shows because you know, for yeah, be nice for performance and be able to you know, amaze the crowd and be able to say, hey, I can do another tricks, not just a regular spin, but have different elements in my bag that I can, I can just bring when I come in. Mm -hmm. home. It's important to be very diverse, not just be a spinner or just do jumps. I think my good skills were that I was able to do many things and bring a lot of diverse elements. And that's why the, the public like my skating, I think, because, you know, it was just entertaining. Yeah. What does, is that uh, one of the, the influences of your days of tumbling that, that you're able to bring to your skating? Uh, 
oh, for sure, the, all my background definitely helped me. All, I mean, I don't think fencing didn't because I didn't do enough, but I think gymnastic or tumbling helped me and trampoline because for the height and for the rotation and I was able to do a quad twist and trampoline and mm -hmm. it helped me and for skating, it, it helps. So yes. Right. Yeah. Why did you decide in that moment to do that uh, backflip? Uh, so this took place at the 1998 Olympic Games in Nagano. Well, 98 Olympics, I think for me, was very uh, a tough seasons because I just come back from injuries you know, where I broke my Achilles tendon. So I went and I, my goal was really to be able to have my last Olympic Games and say, okay, I can do it. Let's practice hard. Let's be in pain. I'm okay. It's going to be hard, but I can make it happen. So that was my goal and I, I did. But after, sadly, just... Right before the short program, I hurt and I pulled my legs. That was like, you know, I was devastated. And the only thing coming and get ready for what practice for three years really hard and come be on the site and be able to perform and you almost can't. That is horrible. As an athlete, it's like, why? So close to the goal, mm -hmm. to my goal maybe to withdraw and to go to say, no, I can't, I have to scratch, go back home because I'm too much in pain or maybe just stay and watch this in a stand. Uh, for me, it was like unthinkable. And I was like, no, I can't do that. And I'm like, there was just too much effort between my parents walk, do everything for me, my coaches, all those training, training in, in France and move to America to train for, to be better for that. It can happen. So I thought that you know I need to continue and I have three days. I have one day off between the short program and the long. Maybe I can maybe relax and find a way to feel better, heal. And sadly, uh, you know, when you're an athlete that high at the Olympics, no drugs, no no doping, nothing, nothing help. You can do anything because you can cheat, it's normal. I get it, but you can even receive some pills to painkiller. Because painkiller have some doping control, you know, are bad for the doping control. So I couldn't get anything, any treatments besides ultrasounds and some massage. Well, you know, when you pull muscle, <laughs> it's not really helping. <laughs> yeah. Painkiller, really strong painkiller, like probably like knock you out for a night. But after you're like, okay, I'm ready. I think I can do it. Right. So yes, that was that was my real problem over there. Yeah. So, yeah. That's why when I decided I did my program, I was like, I did couple triple jumps and I was okay, but I still in extreme pain. At this point, I'm like, okay, I can go. My program is a four minutes, four minutes and 15 seconds. It's forever long. When you're in pain, you're like, oh my God, can you just turn off the music? Well, I guess mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be, you know, strong and pretend the life is beautiful, even though you're in pain. So it's what I did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's that's point, I'm like, I don't want to fall. I don't want to crash. I don't want to bomb the whole thing. Why don't I just turn around and don't do it? Forget about my triple jumps and do my, my backflip and land on one foot so people won't kill me because any triple jump is counted as long as you land on one foot. It's what the same right. is. So if I do my backflip and land on one foot, um, Wait, they didn't tell, they didn't explain what rotation is supposed to be this way or this way. Right, right. <laughs> so you're, you're, you're dancing in the gray areas of the rules. Yeah, I kind of play with the rule. As long as I'm one, one foot, I'm okay. <laughs> Absolutely, that's funny. So uh, 98 was your last Olympic Games. Yes. And then, you know, because you grew up as a little girl watching all these shows in Nice, you decide that you're going to go tour. So you did that for how long? Back in the days, being a, skater, a professional skater was a big thing. It was like mm -hmm. a job, not like a tennis player where they make millions because you turn pro. Sadly, no. But still, yeah. for the, a, it was a big thing. You mean That means being professional, that means you tour in this company, this name, and uh, you're allowed and, and it's fun and you're okay to receive money without having any uh, trouble with your federation because you're out of the circuit. 
but now we perform anywhere for anybody. And that was a great thing. You know, sadly, figure skating, don't, we never attract sponsors. You know, mm -hmm. because we never had a Rolex and say, hey, if you skate and you do show your work, you know, nothing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We are women and we are graceful and we, we do, we are athletes like many other sports, but somehow we don't attract and skating is a poor sport. Because mm -hmm. you pay for training all your life, uh, every year, it costs you know, around 250,000 approximately if you're on a top, top level to, uh, you know, to be able to do one full season and still yeah. you know, our own pockets or your federation a little bit will help you or, or because you do a couple shows and after you save your money, so you can train or buy dresses and you can pay your coaches or your choreographer. And it's right. That's why after all those years of efforts, I felt, you know what, professional is still good, it's still kicking. I can see there is a lot of professional skaters like Katarina Witz, uh, Yuka Sato was already, uh, already a pro. Uh, there's many Midorito, all those, Brian Bretano was already pro. So I'm like, why don't I turn pro, make some money? At this point, I'm like, you know, it's hard. Compete mm -hmm. and we are the top five and eight or top is hard. So I thought that maybe professional would bring me excitement and, and I feel good to entertain the whole crowd and make some money on the way, but still perform for many companies. That was my goal. And mm. I was on ice, champions on ice, holiday on ice. You can name many companies and travel all over the world because of that. So it's a big bonus. And I was able to fulfill my skating career and uh, leave my dream. Awesome, awesome. So uh, what do you do now, Surya? Well, now I'm a coach since uh, my last big show was November 2014 and uh, in Brazil. So it was one you know, big things. I too prior that for five months in France in Holiday on Ice and I did a big huge tour. We did, we did like 90 CDs, I was uh, 90 shows. It was awfully hard because I was just 40 years old and I'm like, yeah, I'm performing now, you know, <laughs> huge tour. it's really hard on my body, but I love performing and same thing, I forget the pain, I'm like, I can do it. And it was great, it was awesome. Mm -hmm. And after my really my last show was in Brazil in Sao Paulo, and I, I think it was great. I never been in Brazil in my life before, and performing in figure skating was also, uh, you know, something new. And mm -hmm. uh, somehow it was my last show, so it's kind of sad in a way because you know when you're a performer, we're not comedians that we can do this all our life. Like you know, until we turn seventy, you probably still do something. <laughs> so, yeah, this is true. But. I really love it. This passion is how to just quit and say, okay, no more done. And, uh, but now I went all the side of the board. I turned and now I'm a, you know, I'm a coach and I help skaters and, uh, hopefully, you know, I will have a one, one day, a great skater who believe in me, even though I don't have yet, you know, a good, uh, uh, a good champion because sadly mm -hmm. you you know there is politic people came to you because you had this champion so and so came to your training center and came and be, and suppose, supposedly you were like cool coach for people that right trained. right like, i know i can be a good coach but nobody you know only had little one and uh, so i hope i cross my fingers that one day i will have somebody who trusts me and i can show him how to you know give my best and my experience right. together and do some amazing things but so awesome. far, young one, you know, very young, from the learn to skate, or even like give them, you know, good advice and teach them until they turning 18 or go to college. And, and often I'll say, you don't need to be a coach, or, you know, Olymp Olympian. You can just coach anyone as long as you help them. I think it's a great thing, great um, uh, experience and you help a lot because many teenagers need your help any kids think that probably mm -hmm. second person at home you cannot like the second parents or the third parents you, you can give advice and they kind of sometimes trust you give you that they give you your trust and i think it's mm -hmm. good so, what i'm doing
How are, how are you coaching now uh, during COVID-19? Uh, well, during the quarantine, where we were all quarantined, we did a lot of Zoom classes. For one month, nothing. And after I said, okay, well, there's something else than just stay home and just feel horrible and stay home all day. And so we decided to do some Zoom class for three months. And it was good because I felt that, like many other coaches, that kids are stay home doing nothing. They don't know what to do. And... Uh, and they need to do something. So we felt that, you know, continue to maintain the connection with the sport and uh, stay some, somewhat in shape, even though yeah. we do in our living room, I think was a good, very good and very benefit, beneficial. Yeah. And, and somehow actually for some skater, I think they kind of figure it out what they do off ice and figure it out their body, what to do, what this part of body can do. and. Because sometimes you go on ice, you practice, you have no time, you boom, boom, you do your practice and you go home. Well, now we've been working at home and it was just such a good technique training. And I think it was helpful, I think, for many students. Mm -hmm. And yeah, but now, luckily, us since two months now, two good months or three months now, we have ice. Skating rinks are reopened and we still have to be careful, you know, with the virus you know, to keep distance and coaches have to keep the mask on. Right. We can teach and we can still give hope for our students, any students who need help and wanted to skate and feel free on ice and just want to do something else and just stay home and just do homework. Yeah. Is there a contact information you have that someone could, if they wanted to get some Surya coaching, they oh. could find you? Oh, well, I guess on Facebook or oh, Instagram, definitely my Instagram is, I think, Surya Bonelli one and Facebook also, they can find me and, uh, you know, uh, somehow people, sometimes they figure it out. I don't know. I get a message next morning <laughs> on, on my uh, email. I'm like, where did you find me? Like, oh, I find you. So there's always a way to find me. But I'm teaching in Las Vegas now and it's a new thing for me because I was teaching in Las Vegas for many years mm -hmm. and at where I went to teach at real big training center in Minnesota where skating is very popular and there's rings everywhere you can imagine. And I wanted to go back home first because it was way too cold and I need to go back home and just stay home with my mom and with my dogs and all that. So right. I like home. And so now I'm teaching here. It's hard because people don't re remember me or they don't know me, but you know, I'm here yeah. to teach. And, uh, you know, I don't, I think it's a special experience and special to be able to practice with me because I do have the knowledge. And even though I did perform, I competed 20 years ago, I still can jump, you know, I still can right. continue while I practice and I can still do, still do some triple jumps. So, I mean, I still get it. I'm not that old, you know, <laughs> yes. no, uh, you know, you don't understand when you experience for 30 years trying training and practice and gain this experience and get this special technique it doesn't disappear just like that because you retire we have it right and so hopefully i will find some students who believe in me and figure it out that you know they can trust me because for many years i did a lot of jumps triples and quadruples and somehow you know i had the way to to get it so they can trust me i'm not a charlatan i'm real yeah yeah absolutely so yeah this 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 has been awesome i'm so glad i got a chance to connect with you as i said to you before we started the interview the last time i saw you was 1992 just during, during the opening ceremonies and it's great to connect with you reconnect with you i'll be virtually but you know it works for now um Thank you for joining us and sharing your experiences and your wisdom and keep on pushing your, your story, your life uh, as a trailblazer, as someone who had the door open for her and, and kept that door open for others. You epitomize the keep on pushing philosophy. So once again, thank you for joining us. I do encourage a lot of kids and many people to come and skate because skating not just a sport for white. Everyone is welcome to do it. You know, and it's, it's nice. So don't be don't be scared to come and try. It's nice and chilly, but 
it's fun experience and you will love it. And they know where to find you. Absolutely. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.